All right, go ahead. All right, hello everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming to our first weekly Oct Talk speaker event. Uh, we welcome you to comment and ask questions in the chat or we'll, questions. We'll we'll wait till the end. We'll do a little question period. I'm Dawson Weinman. I'm the director of student life at Frost Student Association. I'm joined today by Adam Fallen, the president of the Frost Student Association, and of course Chris Catola, the head field research coordinator at Fauna Forever. Fauna Forever is a nonprofit organization managing a series of monitoring, training, and conservation projects in the Amazon rainforest region of Madro. Madre de Dios in southeastern Peru. Today, Chris will be presenting his talk, Life in the Amazon, Earth's Disappearing Eden. We're very excited to have you here, Chris, and please take it away. All right, thanks guys. Uh, you know, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. I'm excited to, to speak to everybody. Hopefully you enjoy it. Um, it is about, I'm actually in England at the moment uh, for everybody who hasn't sort of heard our talk already. So, uh, because we had to close our camps back in, uh, in April of last year. So uh, I'm, I'm in, in England at the moment. It's 12.05 uh, a.m. here. So if at any moment I seem a little bit groggy, I do apologize, but uh, I, I had a little nap, so I should be fired up and ready to go. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, today's presentation, um, there's, a, there's so much. I mean, I could probably do like four or five presentations because there's so much to talk about, as you probably can imagine. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is just give you a little bit of background about our, our organization. Um, a little bit of what it's like working in the Amazon, um, just kind of a taste of that. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, a, a little bit about, you know, some of our major research teams and some of the work we're doing. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to talk, you know, a, a, a little more in detail about some of the issues facing um, the Amazon and I guess specifically the Peruvian Amazon, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the, uh, the, the conservation you know, concerns and, and, and major threats uh, you know, facing our region. So without further ado, let me uh, go ahead and get started and just give you Really brief introduction to myself. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on myself, but we'll just make it quick. Um, yeah, so had, I've been with Fauna Forever now for um, over three years in terms of either being in the field or helping develop projects. Um, I've done about two years straight in the jungle, about like 22 and a half out of 24 months. Um, quite literally in the jungle. That's, I don't have an apartment. I don't have a home. I mean, when I'm there, I live in the field stations. That's it. Um, so yeah, I've been out of the jungle for the last almost year, but, uh, in a non COVID world, that's where I'd be right now. Um, and in terms of what, uh, head field research, uh, field research coordinator, I mean, titles are always kind of annoying, but you know, cause they, they're just, they're very wordy, but basically what that means is that, uh, when we're in camp, um, I'm kind of overseeing sort of the fact that camp is, is running smoothly, um, make sure everybody has bed, make sure everybody has food make sure all their research projects are going well, make sure any of the courses, just make sure everybody's happy. That's sort of what head, head field research coordinator means. But obviously that's not all I'm doing. I'm actually, I'm, I, aside from sort of overseeing everything a little bit at camp, um, I'm also directly involved in coordinate, coordinating and designing projects and actually you know, collecting data for our bird, bat, and, and, and the herpetofauna research team. And um, I'm gonna guess, you know, I'm speaking to people who obviously know wildlife. So, you know, herpetology, herpetofauna, I think we all know what that is. Uh, I'm just gonna say herps from now on um, because it's just a lot easier to say. So, <laughs> um, so when I say herps, you guys know what I mean. So yeah, I'm usually in charge of birds, bats, and herps in terms of directly coordinating work. Um, so yeah, that kind of covers me, but enough about me. Let's, let's, uh, you know, let's talk more about Fauna Forever, the organization. So yeah, as you can see, there's a lot to the organization. Um, basically, it comes down to, uh, you know, I would say there's sort of um, three major, I've kind of got four here, but in my mind, it's kind of three major threads. Wildlife monitoring, and this is sort of long-term monitoring projects. Um, the majority of those uh, are involving birds, large mammals, uh, herps, and bats. Uh, we certainly have some, you know, botany projects and some invert projects as well. But the majority of our resources and our time in terms of long-term wildlife monitoring programs definitely goes into birds mammals, uh, herps, and bats. Um, we also so we also support outside researchers, masters, PhD students, and even of course our own sort of intensive and focused research projects. So these are um, a little different than long-term monitoring. I, I guess it's kind of obvious, but uh, we're talking about something where it has a definite, you know, question, a start date, an end date, you know, there's a paper published, there's a project completed. Um, so they're kind of more contained projects. Long-term monitoring theoretically goes on indefinitely. Whereas, you know, an intensive project has got a beginning and an end. 
Um, and then when it comes to community development and conservation, uh, yeah, sort of sort of a, you know uh, you know community development and and conservation initiatives. Um, I mean, they are they are sort of directly they're sort of linked, but I guess they're a little bit different. A community development is mostly focusing, as it says, on ecotourism development, agroforestry, um, eco lodges, and their private land concessions. Um, so this is helping local people in the area to actually sort of make money off of their land in ways that is more sustainable. That's 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 the easiest way to describe it. And then the conserv the, the conservation uh, you know programs that we work with, we, we work with and we help support. Um, they are often a part of that ecotourism and agroforestry, but they also involve working with the government um, and working with other conservation organizations in the area. Um, and of course, you know, as it says, like actually contributing to the overall sort of global, uh, you know, you know, database and knowledge base for the for the animals that, that are in our area and the wildlife in our area. So, you know, it's pretty pretty broad based, as you can tell. Um, I think for today, we're going to be focusing in terms of the work we do. We're definitely going to be focusing mostly on the four major teams I mentioned, which of course are the birds, uh, the bats, the herbs, and the large mammals. Those are the in terms of the when I describe our work sort of overall, those are the teams I'm going to focus on mostly. Um, give you guys an idea of where we're where we're working. I mean, I think you guys know know geography, but it's still sort of nice to see it sometimes. I mean, some of you probably been to South America, some of you probably been to like Costa Rica, Central America. Uh, but for some people, you know, South America, when you think of the Amazon, you just think sort of Brazil, and you don't really realize where it is. So yeah, it's kind of nice to know where Peru is in relation to everywhere else. Um, in terms of where our research site is, um, you can kind of see there's there's Lima on the right there, the the big red dot. Hopefully, you can see my uh, cursor there, um, pointer there. The big red dot is is uh, Machu Picchu, which you know a lot of people have probably heard of. If you've ever thought about going to South America, you've probably heard of Machu Picchu. And then the region we work in is over here. Uh, this whole region, but specifically this area in here, which is which is close to the city of uh, Puerto Maldonado. So, you know, I, I'm not going to make it a big um, tourist advertisement for Peru, but I will say, speaking, you know, as a Canadian, like I'm from from Toronto and I, I grew up east of the city. Um, one of the things I love about Canada is how diverse it is. I, I actually miss Canada a lot, and I miss not being able to explore it. I wish I'd explored it more before I sort of left. Um, but yeah, Canada, as we all know, Canada is a super diverse country. It's great. And I mean, Peru is really, for South America, it's very similar because you have ocean, you have mountains, you have jungle, you have deserts, you have an amazing variety of habitats. And I've been, you know, I have, there's a lot of Peru for me left to explore, but I have been fortunate enough to be able to, to, to visit some other researchers and actually lead some tours. And I've been up and down the coast. I've been down to, you know, Lake Titicaca, you can see it there. And obviously, I've been in the, in, you know, uh, spent a significant amount of time in, in the jungle in Peru. So, um, yeah, if you're ever thinking of coming to South America, definitely uh, Peru. I would highly recommend it for a lot of reasons. Um, yeah, in terms of our research sites, so you can see that's kind of a zoom in. Um, you know, we we've, we've done some work in the Andes and Cusco in the Cusco region, but the majority of our research does take place in in the Madre de Dios, and all those yellow dots represent uh, historical research sites. Um, the one thing I didn't mention in the introduction to Fauna Forever is that it's actually one of the oldest NGOs in the area. Um, so technically, the name Fauna Forever has been around, I think it's 11 years now. Um, but the research that we're doing, especially the long-term monitoring, it's actually been going on for over 20 years. Um, our director, Dr. Chris Kirby, he actually did his PhD um, on the impact of ecotourism, and that involved a huge amount of wildlife monitoring to sort of determine that impact. And the methodologies and protocols and research that he did then has continued on into Fauna Forever. So we're looking at this, this, this long-term monitoring has been going on for over 20 years. In fact, um, his presence in Peru, his work there predates the Tambacata National Reserve. He was actually consulting on the, on the development and, and, the, the, design, and the, the opening of that reserve. So. You know, we have as an organization, you know, I've only been with us three years, but as an organization, we have a long history of working in the region. Um, and one of the things interesting about our organization is that we're not only sort of at one site forever. We move around. Often we move to two to three different sites per year in a normal year. So we're sampling at many different sites throughout different seasons and different years. Um, and one other thing too, you know, I, I just have this slide because I think, you know, speaking for myself, you know, maybe I'm just bad at geography, I don't know, but, you know, before I thought about going to Peru, you know, I was just, I, I didn't really associate southeastern Peru with, you know, the Amazon that much. I mean, you know, there's jungle, but you're like, 
is that really Amazon rainforest because it's pretty far south, right? Well, I mean, yes, it definitely is. It's, it's part of the Amazon River Basin. I mean, the river that we're working on right now, mostly, which is the Tampapata River, um, literally that water flows from the Andes, which is sort of the, the, the bottom yellow dot. And the other dots represent areas where it meets other rivers. And eventually it actually flows into the Amazon and then right out into the ocean. So yes, it's definitely is Amazon rainforest, no question. It is, um, it is not just tropical or neotropical rainforest. This is truly the Amazon River Basin for sure. Um, and, you know, as you can imagine, you know, that this is pretty much what it looks like uh, all over. Um, a little, the photos I'll use today are, some of them are mine. Um, a lot of them are friends of mine or coworkers or associates, especially a lot of the wildlife, because I'm often too busy holding them or handling to <laughs> take the photos. This particular photo was taken by a, a really good friend of mine who's a wildlife photographer. His name's, his name's Fabian Mulberger. If you're on Instagram or whatever, follow him. He's amazing. Um, but yeah, this is actually taken as a uh, right, like our, our research cut camp and site would be, uh, I guess, kind of in this, the bottom left corner. You can't see it, but that's where it would actually be. So that's uh, an amazing place, amazing place. So, you know, in terms of um, most of our research sites are along the river. And as you can sort of imagine, that involves a lot of using boats to get around. Um, occasionally, I actually get to drive the boat. Um, I'm happy to drive it when the river is pretty high, actually, uh, when it gets really low. Um, and also after storms, it can get a little sketchy. Um, you can see here, um, that's a tree. That's quite literally a tree that's floating down. And yeah, my, there's a couple of videos that are bad, so just ignore that. Uh, so you never really know what's going to be in the, river, in the river after a storm. And then at night, if you're driving, you never know what you're going to see either. I mean, this is a capybara that just happened to be right beside the boat one night. There's actually a family group. They're quite social. Some of you, I'm sure, probably know about capybaras very well. But they're quite social, so you'll have family groups that can be up to, you know, uh, the biggest I've seen is about 10 individuals with babies, and it's actually freaking adorable. I can't, it's, it's really cute. But yeah, sometimes they just swim by the boat. Um, and yeah, this guy was just kind of chilling out, swimming by the boat. So they're pretty confident in the water because there's not a lot that can, I mean, Jaguar, the big threats for them, I won't send forever on copywriters, but the big threats for them are um, usually Jaguars. Um, which of course jaguars can swim, but there's no, they can't get into the water. Like it's just not gonna happen. Obviously in the water, black caimans and anacondas can be a threat, but for capybaras when they're scared, their instinct is always to just get in the water. It's either to get in the water, yeah, it's either get in the water or run in the forest, but they're much more comfortable getting in the water often than they are in the forest. So yeah, you really never know what you're gonna see when you're in, in, you know, in the river and rivers are really important for access to most of our sites. We often have to take a vehicle to a port and get in a boat drive the boat and then climb up a riverbank to get to our camp. So there's a lot of time in the boat for sure. In terms of what our camp's life life is like, because you know people probably wonder, we have people come down and they're like, where am I going to be living? What's it like? I mean, some of our camps are pretty nice. I mean, this is a camp called Secret Forest where when we go back this summer, this is where we'll be. Um, and you can see it's pretty nice. I mean, wood floors, steel roof, pretty cool. Um, some sites are not that nice. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to name this particular site, but, uh, I spent, uh, five months at one site, which, um, you, when you stood in the shower, if you stood in the wrong spot, you fall through the floor quite literally. Um, so, um, yeah, and it, it was not nice. So it depends on the site. When we're lucky, we get sites like this. When we're not, they're not so nice. It does depend a little bit on the site. And, you know, when it comes to what camps, what life is like, I mean, some of you, I'm sure have done field work already in your life and you kind of an idea, but yeah, it's just really social. I mean, you really get to meet an incredible amount of people. You just, you know, I, I grew up, you know, you watch a show like Survivor and you're just like, um, you're like, um, the, all the drama you see on a reality show, it's like, that's so stupid. There's no way they'd be that emotional in a week. Listen, I've been in the jungle now. I, I kind of believe it now because you become, there's nothing like it. There's no outside contact in, in this site. For example, we have no cell phones at all. We have to drive a boat to get a signal so we can check to see about food. Like there's no signal. So you're, and you spend hours every day with each other in tight confines working. So we, most of the time you become literally lifelong friends. That's why I'm in Europe. I'm visiting friends I've made in the jungle. Um, if you don't like the person, that's a problem, and that's rare, but you know, that, that's happened. But uh, usually it's an amazing experience, field work like this. So if any of you have done it, you already know that. If you ever think me doing it, I, I can't recommend enough. It's, 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 it's amazing. Um, and you know, one of the good things about it is that, you know, we actually do get to interact with a lot of local people. I mean, obviously, if you look at that photo, let's be honest, it's a lot of white people. It's a lot of gringos in a Latin American country. And 
yeah, I mean, that can definitely be a, an issue. Um, we're, we try our best as an organization to, um, you know, to have Peruvians working with us. Um, finances are often an issue, but like we definitely have Peruvians who are um, boat drivers, cooks, that kind of thing. But in terms of having, you know, interns and volunteers, it can be a bit of a challenge for us to get them in, but we try our best. It's usually funding that limits us. But even if we don't have a lot of Peruvian researchers with us all the time, we'll have, you know, we always want to have more, but even when we don't, we're always working with local people in the community, whether that's someone who, that were, in this, in this case, for example, we were staying at a family's um, home, bit farm, basically, and researching their, their uh, conservation concession. And then, yeah, in this case, this is actually a local family that came over for lunch from a community. They just hop in the boat, they come over. And I have just actually, we were processing and measuring some snakes that we caught the night before. And this girl, I mean, snakes in Peru, most Peruvians are petrified. They're so scared. They just grow up thinking that snakes will attack you and kill you. So the idea of one, they just freak, right? And, you know, this is such a cute species of snake. This, this uh, Dipsis catspii. If you can't, if you don't think this species of snake is cute, I mean, I can't help you really. Um, so we, yeah, we managed to get her to actually hold it and the, all the kids did and it was really great. So we try our best to involve the community that way. And I mean, you know, you can see this, uh, this the, the, the man standing there, his name is Cheeky. Um, he's an absolute legend. I mean, legend is understating it. I can tell you stories about this guy it's, that's just unbelievable. He's, he's an amazing, I mean, this guy, yeah. So let me, let me, I'll one quick story, then I'll move on. He actually, this guy literally said, uh, has, has, you know, lived in the jungle alone hunting for weeks because that's, that's what he used to do is hunt. I mean, that's just part of the culture, obviously. And he's like, the very best way to see animals and to go hunting is completely naked in the jungle because you smell when you sweat and obviously your clothes absorb the sweat. Whereas if you're naked, you actually just, you know, basically evaporates and drips off you. So this guy literally for weeks on end would just go literally into the middle of the rainforest naked. And it sounds like a story, but it's, trust me, I, I know Cheeky, it's true. So, uh, yeah, it's really cool to get to interact with them. And yeah, as I said, I mean, just, you know, making friends. I mean, I can pick out every person in this photo. This was the last time we were in camp actually in April. And uh, every person in there is a lifelong friend. And I mean, the guy in, in the front middle in the Heineken shirt, Cheeky, I get a nickname, but that's just everybody. He's he's uh, he was our boat driver again, a legend. Like my life's in his hand because I'm hanging out. You'll see in a minute. I'm hanging out the front of a boat in a river at night, and he's the driver. And you know he has to do exactly the right thing so that I can get to a position to catch a caiman. And yeah, he's he's a legend. So you really make it's, it's amazing. You, you really make great friends being out in the jungle. Um, so I'm going to show you this. This is a kind of a bit of a you won't be able to hear it, but just watch it anyways. Um, you know, one of the things is um, when it comes to working in the rainforest, yeah, there's cheeky being cheeky. Um, it is a rainforest and definitely rain is a major part of it. People often wonder about that. Um, if you heard, if you had sand, you'd be able to hear it, but you can see that's, that's kind of a um, normal kind of uh, storm. That's not even the heaviest rain at all. So definitely rain is, is, a, is a big part of living there. And, you know, the rain can result in some issues in camp. Um, this gives you an idea. This was actually our kitchen. Um, that is completely inundated by water from, yeah, from that rain. Um, and yeah, also it is a lot of work. I mean, this is my friend, Patty, actually, uh, I'm staying with him and his family right now, actually here in England. I'm using his office for the presentation, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's a lot of work. I mean, I think some people, you know, they're like, oh, you're in the Amazon. You get to play with animals and see monkeys and macaws. Yeah, I guess that's true, but it's also super hard. Like. I usually walk about 15 to 20, uh, 15 to 20 kilometers a day in temperatures that are, well, humidity is 95% or more most, most of the entire day. And the temperatures can be 32 to 36 in the middle of the day, at least. Uh, highest I actually had is 38. But um, so yeah, it, it, it's really hard work. I mean, we all love it. Uh, we don't really get paid basically anything. I don't even wanna tell you what I make, but it's pretty pathetic. Um, actually, I haven't been paid in over a year, but basically not for the money, but it's definitely for, um, it's definitely for the, you know, this the amazing experience, but it, it is, it's physically draining, but you know, it's worth it for sure. And I mean, being able to see things like this, you know, sites like that, as you're, you know, this is like what you see before you start your nighttime sampling session. Um, and yeah, this is, uh, this is, this, this is actually Coca-Cola Lake. And um, yeah, I mean, just seeing things like that, knowing that that's all jungle in the background. I mean, it definitely makes it worth it. Aside from the wildlife and the people, 
just being able to be down there is, is that's once in a lifetime experience. I mean, everybody who's interested, you have to get to the jungle in your life for sure. If not for a short visit, maybe longer. Um, so yeah, I mean, in sort of moving away from what life is kind of like, let's start to go into a little bit about what our work is and what we're doing. So, um, you know, in terms of our long-term monitoring objectives, you know, why are we doing it? Um, what are we hoping to get? You know, it, again, there's a lot of things long-term monitoring can give you that focused research and short-term research can't. So yeah, changes over time, anthropogenic impact, climate change, conservation methods, species, species inventories. These are all things that you, you, you need a long time to, to achieve, you know, you can't, you, you're talking, for example, with birds, uh, over 600 species of birds in our area. I mean, that's, that's as many species basically as there is in Canada, potentially, um, in one, one part of Peru. I mean, just it's, the diversity is crazy, right? Um, I mean, Peru has 1800 species, but just our, our region has 600 and that's just birds and folks. You know? So, you know, you need a long, large amount of sampling to actually identify what species are present or not. So long-term monitoring helps with that. And then in terms of specific sort of focused research projects, there's so many questions. It's absolutely mind boggling how little we know down there. Um, there's still lots of things we don't know about animals in North America and Europe, but imagine, imagine where we were in research in North America and Europe in kind of like the fifties or sixties. And that's kind of where we are, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the Amazon now, it's so far behind. So yeah, differences between sites, protection, uh, you know, how does agriculture and logging impact it in different areas? Spatial ecology, that's, that's a big one of mine. I'm really interested in trying to develop projects about that. Uh, territory sizes, habitat usage, behavioral, morphological adaptations, life history traits. There's just so much, it's almost limitless. Um, I really enjoy helping develop people with their projects, actually. Uh, we have like nine people coming down to do PhD and master's projects over the next few years. And um, yeah, being involved in their projects and helping develop it is just super exciting, along with some of our own and you know, a few projects of my own that I'm trying to work on as well. Um, now, one of the things, just to give you an idea of what we can work on, is um, this is a really blown up map that you can see the little dot that says Secret Forest. Um, and then across the river, you know, sort of um, south of it, you'll see one that says uh, Neotropical Station, TNS. And you notice that there's green and then there's not green, which means that the Green area is the, the town of Plata National Reserve, so protected, of course. And across the river, it's it's not really protected. So there's been a lot of uh, selective logging. There's hunting going on. There's just it's a lot of human impact. So this is a great example of some of the research projects that are sort of focused projects that we are really interested in. Is determining you know what impact does the reserve have on species as compared to the areas that aren't protected, having the ability to sample simultaneously, basically, you know, maybe the next day, but you know, within the same time per frame, the same period of the year, um, at a very similar, just literally only separated by like a kilometer, you know, the, but the big difference is one is protected and one's not. So that's an example of sort of a type of research project that we're, we have quite a few projects going on at the moment that are sort of trying to answer that type of question. And, you know, this is really, this satellite image, the same, same spot I just showed you, you can really see how, again, maybe you can see my arrow, but, you know, up here, Secret Forest versus down here, this is primary, this is beautiful, like, I don't even know if a human has ever walked where I'm probably not, right here, I mean, literally, it's that pristine, whereas this, almost all the high-value trees have been destroyed here, but when you look at it, or cut down, when you look at it, like, from above, it it basically looks the same, you know, and that's one of the things that you realize when you go there is how different each forest is and how the impact from humans is sometimes not as obvious um, as it might appear. You know, I'm going to talk a bit later about deforestation in Peru, um, but I mean, yeah, a lot of times we're working in forests that is actually very different because of human, um, human, human effect, human impact, um, human activities. But um, to the naked eye, as you fly in a plane, you wouldn't know it. And we're trying to look into those questions of what impact does that type of modification have on us? Um, some of our different um, research methodologies, you know, so I'm going to talk about literally how do we do this research quickly. Some of you probably already know this. Some of you probably learned about this. Some of you may be really well versed. Some of you may not. So if I'm telling you something, you know, you know, my apologies, but just to give you the basics of what we do. Um, and I'll focus on the mammals and then the, uh, the birds and bats and then the herfs. And then after that, I'm going to you know, fo focus more on the conservation issues specifically. But yeah, when it comes to mammals, so basically, you know, we're looking at line transects that are 500 to 1500 meters long. That's a big part of our survey. 
um, the um, you know when we're when we're encountering mammals visually um, or acoustically, but it's usually visually for mammals. Um, you know, we're looking at um, different which species is it? What's the size of the group when we encounter them? Um, what distance from the transect line and what height are they with their with their primates, for example? Um, so if some of you may have already probably learned, and some of you probably know very well about you know line transects and distance sampling. But it's very important that we actually are able to accurately estimate or measure, you know, where was an animal in relation to that transect line. Um, so that's that's part of the skill that comes into it. We also look for other things such as tracks, scats, burrows. Um, they are used more for presence and absence, but they're still really important for us to, to, to note and record. Um, and again, the good thing about transects is they allow us presence absence, yes. They allow us relative abundance, which is good as well, but they also allow us to generate models that give you actual population estimates. Of course, there's error in this. There's errors in any model. But without having uh, good transects, it's really the only, really the only way to actually generate population density models. So our mammal teams, um, you know, this is the one team I don't really work with just because I'm only one person. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, they walk a lot. Like I, you know, I said, I usually walk say 15, 20 kilometers a day. Yeah, they do as well because they'll often do like three, four kilometer walk in the morning and then three, four kilometer walk at night. And then they'll do all the walking to and from those sites as well. So yeah, there's a lot of walking if you're on the mammal team. And of course, one of them, this is the most common animal you will see is, um, Brown of goody. <laughs> but yeah, there's nothing like a DVAR. Sorry, that's the species code we use. But yeah, brown of goody. They're really cute, actually, but they're quite common. Um, and then, so actually, 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 Tyrus, which is a, a large weasel, it's actually the only weasel in, in, in our region, um, one of the only in the Amazon, actually, and in the lowlands. Um, yeah, pretty common to see as well. I mean, yeah, if you're there a month, I think I could guarantee you'd see a Tyra. Um, they're really cool and they're really typical. I mean, I love weasels. They're great. And uh, I remember one time there was one coming down a tree um, and it had no idea. It, it was so focused on hunting. It had no idea we were walking on the trail and um, it saw us and it was just like, well, you guys are all adults. I don't care. It, it was literally, I could tell it was like, what the fuck? And it just ran back up the tree. Oh man, it was so funny. Yeah, tires are, tires are really cool animals. So yeah, you, got, you know, brown goodies, tires, you definitely see them. You know, sloths you will see occasionally. They're actually really hard to see because the trees are really tall. They're like 30, 40 meters up. And these guys don't exactly, you know, fly around. They're a sloth. So seeing them is hard. Um, I've seen a few, but they're not that common to be blind. But they're probably more common than we see, but they are, they are, they're, they're there, but not that easy to see. Um, so an, another big part of our research for large mammals um, is uh, primate follows. So what that means is that we actually, um, our, our research team will find a group of primates and actually follow them, literally. It doesn't matter where they go, off the trail, I don't care. You just go, you cut through the jungle with a GPS unit and a data sheet and you follow them. Yeah, one to four hours, depends on a lot of factors, but I'd say like two and a half, three hours is usually pretty normal. Um, and what you're looking at is, is things like group size and structure. So how many are there, um, you know, what, uh, can you tell adults? Can you tell for some species what's the ratio of males to females? Just what is the structure of that group like? Um, and then what it's, it's basically a scan survey. So what that means is that okay, if you think about it, if a monkey's in a tree, how do you record that? Think about it. how do you record that data? You, you write down it's in a tree, but how do you quantify that data, right? So what these scan surveys do, which is really cool actually, um, is basically every ten minutes on a data sheet you have a certain set of columns of data you record. Even if it's the same thing that was happening 10 minutes before, you're still writing it down again. And when you do analysis, you actually have proper, you know, variables you can run analysis on. So it's a scan that's performed with a number of different potential behaviors checked off every 10 minutes as you're following the group. Um, you're recording such things such as food choices, foraging height, group interactions, all these different questions. And, you know, this allows us to determine the group territory size. Um, the group sizes, like how many monkeys are actually in that group and what habitat preferences, you know, are they showing? Um, for example, one of our, um, one of our, our follows that resulted in the, the, the you know, the, re the result that um, squirrel monkeys at one of our sites were always going into a really bad bamboo area to rest. And I say bad because bamboo is literally like the devil. It is the worst thing in the world. It'll just shred your body when you walk through it. It's horrible. And our poor researcher, she, she would wear like leather jeans 
or sorry, not leather, but jeans in the jungle because the, she had to to get through the bamboo. But she um, she actually you know noticed that they they were always resting in the bamboo, and, and the likely reason is that they're safe. People can't hunt them there. Um, nothing terrestrially can quickly get to them because of the bamboo. They have to worry about large eagles like harp eagles, but other than that, terrestrially they're safe. So just you know, these are the things we can learn by doing these types of follows. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously we have, uh, you know, Madre de Diaz has, I believe, <laughs> I should know this off the top of my head, but it's about four, 13 or 14 species of monkey primates in Madre de Diaz. In our region, there's about uh, nine species. Um, one of them, unfortunately, is not present anymore because of overhunting. Those are spider monkeys, sadly. Um, they are in protected areas, but not where we're working right now because it's been hunted out, unfortunately. It's very sad, actually. Um, but yeah, we, we, we see the, the dusky titis pretty commonly, you know, we, the, the, the saddleback tamarins, um, and of course, howler monkeys. And I mean, if you've been to Costa Rica, you've probably heard, or Central America, you've heard howler monkeys there. It's a different species, but still, there, there's, there's just nothing like the sound of a howler monkey in real life. I mean, if you hear it on TV, it's just not the same. Trust me, when you hear it in real life, it's, it's a whole different experience. So getting woken up by them literally before it's bright out is a common, is, well, it's an everyday occurrence in the jungle for sure. Um, yeah, and then in terms of, you know, camera trap or uh, mammal research and camera traps. Yeah, we have usually 20 or more camera traps, you know, set up across our research sites. They're placed along trails generally for access and animals, mammals use the trails. So it's a good place to see them and they're spaced out. It depends on the site, but it could be 200 meters, could be 500 meters, could be a kilometer. Uh, but they're spaced out at regular inter intervals so we can have an array set up across the site. Um, again, really good for presence absence. I mean, when it comes to cats, for example, that is the, the best way to find that they're there is presence absence. And yeah, relative abundance data as well. So you can tell which is more common than another. Um, identification, some species like some cats, like jaguars, you can actually tell individuals because of the markings, the spots and the markings. Um, and yeah, it's also good for monitoring, you know, human presence and illegal activity at a site. So, you know, some of the species you'll see, you know, this is a, a, a collar peccary. So basically a wild pig, I guess you could just make it simple. There's two species of peccary down there, the white lipped and the collared peccary, but uh, collared is definitely more common these days. This is, I mean, you guys will probably enjoy this. This is, um, this is a giant anteater, which is weird enough as it is, but then, yep, that is a baby on its back. Um, that is how they travel. When they have babies, the babies ride around the back. And then when it's time to nurse, they get off and do their thing. But um, yeah, I'd say it's this, I, re I remember I was at this site, I remember when, our coordinator, mammal coordinator, actually found this and um, they, they saw this video and we were all just so excited to see a baby on the back like that. It was really cool. And then, yeah, of course, cats. I mean, pumas, cougar, mountain lion is the same species. Um, they're the second largest cat in our area. I mean, they're obviously the largest cat in most of the Americas, but in our area, um, the jaguar is the largest. And then, yeah, I mean, there's just obviously jaguar. I mean, that's just you know, it's, it's an amazing cat. Uh, we have five species of cat in our area. Um, believe it or not, jaguars, pumas, you know, margays, ocelots, they're more common than you would think. As long as the area has got enough food, they're more common than you think. But seeing them with your own eyes is really hard. I've seen an ocelot, I've seen three jaguars, and that's it. And that's in two years. So it's, it's very hard. But camera traps, oh yeah, you'll, you'll definitely see them. One night, um, we had on different camera traps across the site, we had four of the species in one night show up across our site. So they're definitely around. Uh, okay, so now moving on to the birds and the bats, which I kind of combined because a lot of the research methods are similar. Um, yeah, so for birds, obviously we put bands on them, you know, like to identify individuals. There's lots of things you can do with that. Um, recapture banded birds, yeah, to determine territory size. You can also work out population size. Um, it's a complicated analysis. It's complicated, but you can do that as well. So you learn a lot by recapturing bird by recapturing birds. Also, their age and a whole bunch of things you can learn about recapturing. Um, yeah, determine sex ratios, collect breeding information, um, identify rare you know rare and hard to identify species. Um, that's really good because a lot of the species when you he hear them or see them, it it really can be quite hard to confirm identity. But having them in your hand, you're able to do it. Um, determine relative abundance of a species. Um, and also determine where habitats, so what habitats birds and bat species use. Now, once so these all pretty much apply to birds and bats equally. The one thing you'll, you may wonder about is whether we can band bats. Um, some of you may have gotten the chance, maybe not this past year, but maybe other years. Maybe you've heard about bat ring, bat banding in North America. And, um, so the basic answer is you. I'll make it simple. You can't band 
most of the bats we have in the neotropics because of the structure of their wing and their thumb it means you can't ban them um so we are unable to we can put temporary markers like literally a marker spot on their ear but that, that obviously that disappears after a few weeks so we're not able to put bands on bats in latin america for the most part but certainly you can with birds and uh, yeah you can in north america and europe as well because of the family of bats we, uh, we have there um yeah and in terms of what we're collecting you know i'll just try to give you a kind of a sample so this is probably like what the heck is this um just watch for a second oh let me get back to that there we go so this is actually me holding a uh it looks like an ant ram and actually blowing on its belly and i'm not doing that for fun what i'm doing is looking for a, what we call a brood patch and you can notice this bird has a definite brood patch 100 percent when i blow the feathers part really quickly and the skin looks kind of a little bit wrinkly so what this means is this bird has just finished incubating eggs and almost certainly has babies in the nest i mean assuming they hatch but very likely does so this uh, that examination allows us to learn more about breeding activity and timing of breeding activity um, and yeah, one of the things we're also going to be looking for, of course, is obviously doing wing examination. So I've got a little ant ran here in my hand, and I'm carefully looking at different features of the, of the plumage in the wing, because we're looking, what I'm looking for is something called a molt limit. I'm not going to spend hours explaining it too, too intensely, because that would be a whole presentation. But I'll give you an example of what I mean really quickly. So this is a different species, musician wren, boring bird, amazing song. I won't play it for right now, but you can Google it if you want, or you can, you know, YouTube it probably amazing song anyways so this bird right there i can tell right away when it's in my hand that this bird is less than a year of age because of differences in feathers but without you guys can probably pick it out now because you're looking and it told you but that's actually where the difference is if you look at the difference on the left the yellow coloration those ones are new and the ones on the right are older feathers so what this means is this bird is probably between four to 11 months of age and i can tell that when we do the wing examination that's called a molt limit and we can determine its age and this is this is a consistent technique used across the entire world to help age birds okay but obviously you need to know the species you need to you need to be good at it, it doesn't something you just pick up in two days but once you get good at it it's, it's really fun and fascinating and very useful for determining aged birds which of course when you know that it helps you learn a lot about their population, uh, you know, uh, their population dynamics and different aspects of the population. And it means you get to be up close with some really amazing birds, no question. I could have shown you a lot of photos, but obviously I just picked a few um, to show you the diversity of what they look like, you know, and having these in your hand is it's pretty amazing feeling. And yeah, I, I did actually get lucky enough to get, <laughs> caught a few toucans and toucanets. Uh, that particular, uh, uh, that's actually white throat toucan, my bad, not toucanet. I'm just editing myself. Uh, there shouldn't be an ET there. Um, that particular bird destroyed my hand. He just shredded it. I was bleeding because um, their bills are serrated like a knife and they actually go back and forth on the finger to, uh, to cut you. So yeah, I look happy and I was, but I was also bleeding my other hand. But anyways, um, and the same with bats. I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, this is a bat where that one of our interns is actually, I'm supervising her as she extracts it from the net. The bats down there are nothing like the little bats we have in Canada. They are so big and they are so aggressive. I mean, you can see how big this bat is here. This species here, uh, uh, Cryptopteris aridus, it eats other bats, it eats frogs, it eats small birds, it's a carnivore. Um, it weighs about 100 grams, which is ridiculous. The bats in Ontario weigh around 10 grams. This is a 100 gram bat. So it takes a bit of skill and <laughs> courage to actually process them. And, you know, sometimes when you get them, you actually get a surprise. This is a, a tibia, it's a type of fruit bat. Um, and look, yeah, that is a baby holding on. Um, it, we caught that in the net. And um, it's uh, when, when we can't control if they have babies, right? When we catch them. But when they have babies, we obviously release them immediately. We identify the species and that's it. Go ahead, mom. You're busy. Go. But it shows you, you really never know what you're going to get in the net. And sometimes, yeah, we actually caught quite a few babies. And um, just to let you know, it's all a success to release. They're really good mothers um, and the babies know how to hang on. Um, they're actually hanging on by holding the teeth as they fly. So that's one of the ways they stay attached. Um, and yeah, amazing diversity of species. Um, I mean, if, if, you, if you like bats, I mean, I, I'm sure people in Africa and Asia will argue with me, but Latin America is pretty incredible with the species. We have a, about 117 species of bats potentially in the area that I work in. So. Uh, really hard to identify some but really cool 
Um, and then when it comes to bird and bat, uh, sort of acoustic research methods, yeah, point counts, which a lot of you probably know with, with different things with birds and others, other animals you can do it with as well, even frogs um, and, you know, uh, toads, but uh, birds it's used for a lot. And we do that with birds, absolutely. It's very difficult. It takes a lot of experience to be able to do it, but, you know, we, we do it, I do it. Um, we use, uh, obviously, bat detectors for bats. Um, you know, we, it's, it allows us to identify species of birds in the canopy because the mist netting we do, the banding for the birds, it only gets birds low. It doesn't get birds up in the trees. So obviously we need to use point counts for that. Um, it also allows us to identify, uh, you know, insectivorous bats because the bats that I showed you us catching are all, well, they're mostly fruit bats. They're in a family called Phalostomidae. Um, and you can't actually survey Phalostomidae bats acoustically because their echolocation is so quiet it's not good, it's not strong enough for us to pick it up. Okay, so we can't use that survey method. But for all the other bats that are typical insectivorous bats, they're really hard to catch, but we can survey them acoustically. So we kind of have to do both things simultaneously to survey the whole bat community. Um, and yeah, the point counts allow us to actually determine bird density in a similar way that transects do for mammals. Um, and once again, we can take these results and, and tie them to habitat preferences and variables within the habitat to learn more about how they, you know, disperse and live in their environment. Now, when it comes to point counts, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, identifying this is pretty easy. It's a macaw. And as soon as you see the back, you know, if there's no yellow, it's a red and green. If there's yellow, it's a scarlet. Whoopee, it's easy. Anybody can figure that out pretty fast. But man, that's an easy one. There are some super hard birds when it comes to, to point counts to figure out, like, really hard <laughs> um and bats are the same you know when you use acoustic methods there's not that much data down there and remember in ontario for example there's eight species of bats to identify acoustically um, and even some of them are hard like big brown bat and silver haired bat in ontario basically you have to say one you have to almost have a slash like big brown silver haired sp unless you get a certain call that the silver haired does that the big brown doesn't do um, so even in ontario it's hard and same for myota species but down in the jungle, a lot of species don't even have reference calls. So we're like, well, I think it's this, but I'm not really sure. So we're actually working with a few researchers, including one of my really good friends in Belgium to work on uh, designing new software to help identify these species, you know, automated software and programs to do that. But um, it's a challenge, it's a big challenge. Um, and then moving on finally to our last group, which is the herps. Um, this is the most, um, <laughs> the most diverse research methods, which is not surprising because reptiles and amphibians have an amazingly diverse life histories. Uh, if any you like herping, you, you know that. So pitfalls are a big part of it. Um, but, you know, potential to monitor a location continuously, that's one of the advantages of pitfalls, uh, pitfall traps. You know, it's commonly used, as a lot of you probably already know, not just, you know, herp to fun, not just herps, but small mammals, invertebrates. You know, anything that walks on the ground that can fall on a trap, you can use uh, pitfall traps for. Um, um, it's, for us, the most common things we catch are neurons, so frogs and toads and squamates, which are lizards um, the, and relatives, you know, knoll and knolls and yeah, let's just say lizards. I'm not going to, this is all these different common names, but yeah, basically frogs, toads and lizards are what we most ca commonly catch. Um, and it's really good. It's, it, honestly, pitfall traps are kind of the herp version of camera traps. <laughs> They give us a lot of the same metrics in a, in a totally different way of sampling. The resulting data and how we use it is very similar. So yeah, that's a typical pitfall line. I remember putting that one up and digging it in and putting up the plastic. And you know, that's a line of plastic, it's 30 meters long. And then every 10 meters, there is a big bucket that's dug into the ground, okay? Um, so yeah, they're, they're pretty cost-effective. Um, they're a lot of work because you have to check them regularly, but otherwise um, they're very useful and you get some really cool species. I mean, for example, this. I mean, this, that's an adult, that's not a juvenile, that is an adult individual. Look how small that is. If you are walking, doing a walking survey, the chances of finding this are really low. It might happen, but it's hard. Meanwhile, if it just falls in a trap, you go out in the morning, you're like, oh, cool, we got that, done, easy peasy. So yeah, that's an advantage. This species too, I've seen two of these in all the time I've been in Peru, and one of them was in pitfall trap. And it's just a super cool frog. It literally, well, dragon frog is pretty, pretty appropriate because it just, <laughs> it's just a, it's a sick frog straight up. I love it. So yeah, I've only ever seen two and one of them was in a pitfall trap. Um, another one is opportunistic surveys. I mean, opportunistic just means a little bit of everything, walking surveys and random encounters. Um, it's the ability to survey unique habitats, you know, kind of anywhere you want to go. It's just, let's go, let's look what's there. 
if you have friends who go herping, some of you probably do, it's kind of the equivalent of that. It's not structured as much. It's more just kind of go somewhere and see what's there. Um, and it's, it, but it is good for presence absence because there's so many species and they have so many different life histories. You need to be able to kind of look everywhere. And even if you can't determine how many there are of a species, just knowing it's present is valuable. I mean, I can think of many species I've only encountered once or twice. And if we didn't record the data and do these surveys, we wouldn't even know it was there. Um, and it allows us to rapidly survey large distances. We're not confined to typical methodologies. We can just kind of go somewhere and check it out. It's kind of more fun in some ways too. We don't do it that often, but we, when we do it, it's very useful. And it's also good for a tortoise marking and monitoring, which I'll show you in a minute, because you just have to walk along until you find them. You never know where they're going to be. So, for example, this species is one I found in a, a opportunistic survey. It's the aquatic coral snake. It is, yeah, it's, it, it's right up there with Bushmaster. It depends on how you feel about neurotoxins and hemotoxins. But in terms of neurotox, uh, neurotoxins, this is the most this is this is the, this is the most deadly snake in the area. Um, and look at that. That looks like it doesn't even look real. It looks like fake. This snake was amazing. Um, in case you're wondering why I'm holding it, um, that is a safe hold, but it, it takes a lot of experience. So if you guys are ever like in California or maybe Central America, don't just do this, please. Like, just don't. Uh, you really need to know what you're doing. Just be careful. Um, you know, I know what I'm doing. I did it, but uh, I don't want other people to think it's that easy. Um, you need training, you need experience, you need confidence. It's, yeah, it, 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 obviously if it bites me, I, I, would, I would probably die. It's a pretty dangerous snake. Um, there's a good chance of it anyways. Um, so don't, don't mess around as long as they um, and also, um, you know, it is really good. I said the tortoises, we have one tortoise species in the area, yellow footed tortoise, and they just move around everywhere. So what we do when we get a tortoise is we actually mark it. That's what I'm writing right there. And we also put a pit tag in it as well, um, which I'll explain about that with the Caymans, but it allows us to mark them because they can live 50, 60 years. Um, and we may, somebody may catch that tortoise again, <laughs> in 10 years from now easily. Um, and it allows us to learn more about their life history, where they're from. Same reason we would mark birds, we can do that with tortoises. Um, obviously, leaf litter plot surveys or quadrats, my least favorite survey. I hate them, but they are important. <laughs> um, they are 10 by 10 meter plots within a larger survey plot, one hectare. Uh, intensive survey, and this is the thing, it's so much work. You are literally moving every piece of leaf, every leaf, every log, every, oh God, it's so much work. It's just but it's important. Um, high likelihood of finding cryptozoic and fossorial. So if you guys don't know what those terms are, you probably do, but cryptozoic is an animal that's living um, under leaf litter, basically most of its life. And fossorial is under the ground. So um, if you're moving leaf litter and getting you know, down to the ground, you have a much greater chance of encountering these species than if you just look above it, obviously. Um, and again, it's really good for presence, absence, relative abundance, and we can also generate population density estimates if we do enough of these as well. Um, and yeah, like this is a species that you won't find normally. Uh, this is actually a species that we could not identify without genetics that, you know, we honestly we couldn't identify the species. Um, unfortunately, we weren't in position to take genetics, so we had to let it go. Um, it's a tractus. I know that. That's the genus. I don't know the species. But again, this is a fossorial and sometimes, uh, sorry, cryptozoic, partially fossorial species. And if you don't do these types of surveys, you won't find it. And this one too, I remember finding this guy in particular, this little baby. Um, it, literally, I was just almost at the end of the survey and I looked behind me under one piece of leaf and I was like, oh, there he is. Cool. That's what we found. Um, so, and the, probably the research method we use the most is like the mammals, line transect survey. So the difference with ours is ours are 100 meters. Okay. It takes us 45 minutes to over an hour to walk 100 meters because we are looking at every leaf for a frogs that weigh one gram. Okay. Literally. So everybody does their transits a little different, but our methodology is very intensive and very slow. So we don't miss things. Um, I know places in Costa Rica, they do it much faster. That's fine. As long as you're consistent in your methodology and you don't change it every year, it's okay. But we've, we've always looked very closely and carefully. That's why ours are, are very slow. Um, yeah, multiple plots with this. We have like one hectare survey plots throughout each research site, usually two to four depending on the size of the site. Um, yeah, it's a passive survey, which means that instead of sort of moving things, like the survey I just told you about quadrats, we actually visually are looking at things as we move around um, without moving it a lot. 
Um, you know, we have a higher likelihood of encountering, say, you know, tree frogs and tree snakes because, again, you're not moving things much. You're just carefully walking through and things won't jump away, you know, before you can see them. And again, you can get presence, absence, relative abundance and population density. And yeah, species you can encounter, including Bushmaster. This is the only one I've encountered yet, but this is a, if anybody knows venomous snakes, this is like kind of the king of the vipers, some people would say. It's like, the, it's an iconic snake. They're over two meters long. Um, they're, yeah, this was a really amazing girl. She was, yeah, incredible snake. And also this, this is, um, this is a, uh, like a legendary frog for sure. Um, that's, it's just amazing. I mean, if you know frogs in Latin America, you know that this genus and this species is legendary. They're usually up in the canopy around 30 meters. And I was lucky enough to actually find one in February of this year. And it was like, uh, it, it's like, it, it, I, mean, I can't describe it. The feeling of finally seeing one of these come down to the ground to breed was, yeah, unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Um, moving into caimans, which is, yeah, I could spend forever talking about caimans. Yeah, so we usually, usually survey them along large rivers, lakes, streams. Large rivers is the biggest areas we work in usually. Um, we usually have in the rivers, we have like about four kilometer long transects um, that we um, that we cover. And then obviously lakes and streams can be different, but in rivers, it's usually four kilometer transects. Um, visual counts, and we, we try to capture every individual as if possible, but it's obviously not easy. Um, and then mark recapture using the passive integrated transponders, pit tags. Um, so if you have a dog or cat that's got a microchip, that's a pit tag. It's exactly the same technology. And they last basically forever that we've never really seen evidence that they wear out and it allows you to recapture a came in years later and identify that individual without having an impact in their life and again these surveys give us the same thing gives us the ability of presence absence abundance and population density so this gives you an idea of kind of how encounters would work um, this was actually a project that we did with a student doing her master's thesis back in march and april of this year before COVID. Um, and each one of those dots represents an encounter um, so yeah, just kind of gives you an idea of how it would lay out through the area. You can see some of them are in the, in the forest because those are streams, but most of them are actually along the um, the main river, the uh, San Bapata River. Um, you know, if you guys uh, this gives you an idea of what it's like to catch one. I mean, if you guys have talked to uh, Josh Felton about it, um, he's done this kind of thing occasionally as well. When he's been to down Costa Rica, he may have done it for some of you, you may have seen him do it. Um, this is a relatively small one. That's why I was able to pretty easily just carry it back one handed. That's not a very big one, but just an idea of what it's like to catch them. You need to be really quick and really confident when you go for them. Um, no hesitation at all. Um, this is a slightly bigger one. This is a black caiman. Um, so it's a little bit bigger. Nice long tails on them. Really nice species. This is actually a group of students from, uh, Nor uh, from Norway that were with us that night to see us doing it. Um, they're quite excited, as you can tell. Uh, and then we get babies sometimes. This is me doing a, a um, SVL measurement, which is snout to vent length measurement on a baby. Um, and we actually can sex them as well. That's uh, me poking in to determine if it is a male or a female. That looks like a female to me, but again, I can't remember off from that photo, but just from here, it looks like a female. Um, they both have that little thing in there. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, as you can imagine, it's, it's it is bigger on males, but uh, that looks like a female because of the size. Um, and yeah, you'll see the thing in my hand, the yellow thing, that's a scanner. So I'm scanning to see if that came and has been tagged before. Uh, we, uh, based on size, probably not, but you never really know. So, um, so yeah, we scan it. If there's no reading, we put a tag in. And then if we catch it in the future, I mean, this is a young one. So we might catch it in 10 years and have it tagged. Who knows? Um, and yeah, we catch some bigger ones. I mean, this is uh, nearly two meters long. Um, I had to dive on that quite literally on the beach. And then my friend Patty had to come and help me carry it back to the boat so we could measure it. Um, that was a good one. Uh, definitely, <laughs> I remember that one. That was uh, good memories. I love caimans. Um, this is another big one. Um, me and Cheeky caught that one together. Uh, again, I had to dive for this one as well. That sometimes seems to be a, a, a trait of the big ones. They put up a bit of a fight. Um, I love caimans because it's kind of like hunting. Let's be honest, it is, but you're not hurting them. You let them go, they're really tough. And you're doing it for science. So it's kind of like the excitement of hunting without, you know, not that I'm anti hunting, that's a complicated subject. I'm just saying, um, you know, I'm not killing the animal, I'm not really hurting it, but it's also super, super cool to be able to do it and really fun. I can't deny that. I mean, you can see how big they could be. I mean, that's my hand and that's the caiman's foot. So yeah, they're pretty, pretty big animals. Um, so that covers a bit about our kind of research. So now I want to talk a bit about is the sort of the threats like we talked about to cruise uh, Amazon rainforest habitat. 
Um, so the big ones are, you know, legal hunting and animal harvesting. So that means like harvesting for the pet trade. That's a bigger problem in the north of Peru, I think, but it is a problem in Peru um, for sure still. Um, hunting is probably a bigger problem in our area, I'd say. Um, loss of habitat, obviously. This applies everywhere in the world for almost every species, really. But yeah, definitely a problem. Um, gold mining, that's a big one, which a lot of you may not have heard of necessarily because it doesn't get the attention it probably should, but it's a big problem. And obviously climate change. So let me dive in briefly um, to some of these, uh, to some examples of this. So, you know, this is a video from our camera trap. Remember I told you it can be good for seeing things. Um, I want you to look at the, the last guy and what he's got in his hand. And you can see, yeah, that's not a rubber chicken. That is actually a bird. Um, oh, sorry, there. there. Uh, let me see if I can sort of pause it. That's a break. Yeah, you can kind of see right there. So it's, he's already plucked it, unfortunately. But that's a pale winged trumpeter, which is actually a threat. And so it's, it's vulnerable on the IUCN red list. And the only reason it's vulnerable is over hunting. Um, so again, it's complicated. You know, when you talk about any of these subjects, it's really easy for, for any of us, me included, to be, you know, a gringo in Latin America and that they just shouldn't hunt these animals. That's horrible. But also they need to eat and many people are poor and many people, that's how they survive. And hunting is culturally part of their heritage. So it's really complicated. You know, the, it's, a, it's a long subject, which I won't have time to go into all the aspects of it. But basically the goal for, for when it comes to hunting and agriculture and, and anything like that is finding ways to make it sustainable, finding ways to teach the local people, you know, this species, you can't hunt it past a certain point. You can hunt it, I don't care if you, Eat a capybara. I know they're really cute. That sucks, but still, the population can handle it. But species like pale trumpeters, if they're overhunted, they just disappear. You know, spider monkeys were hunted for food, and in many areas, they are gone. That's it. You know, 100 years ago, you could hunt them because there'd be like bow and arrows, and not that many people. When you bring rifles into the equation and a bigger population, it's different. So, you know, finding ways to teach people that, and also finding sustainable ways where they can have a, a, a certain amount of hunt but not a devastating, damaging amount is, is the goal. And it's really complicated. There's no simple, you know, overnight solution. But, um, you know, in this case, this is a protected area and we talked to local people and they, you know, Cheeky actually talked to them and said, listen, like, this is our property. You can come on the land to do what you have to do. You're allowed to do, but you can't go and actually, you know, just kill animals when you're not allowed. So really complicated. Um, when it comes to deforestation, so I've got two photos here of Brazil, and I'll explain why in a minute. That's, that's Brazil, so is this. And this is actually not far east of where we are. It's uh, the state of Acre, um, so just east of where we are in Peru. And you can see this is like large-scale devastation, like just tragic, like farmland destroyed, mostly for cattle, okay? When you look at Peru, it's a little different. This is uh, to the right is parts of Montmato, to the set to the, to the bottom of it is the as the, the Tampapata River, where a lot of our research is going on right now. And then sort of in between those two rivers, you'll see some patchy deforestation, which is along the side of a road. But as I explained to you, it's not as obvious as this, but a lot of deforestation is still occurring, even though, as I told you earlier, it's not as obvious to satellites or to somebody flying overhead. So in Peru, we definitely have fires, uh, we definitely have deforestation, but it's often not as obvious or as visceral as it is in Brazil. You know, Brazil is just like really devastated, obviously. Peru is, is, is lucky in a way that it's not usually as bad, but in some ways, removing all of the high value trees like ironwood and mahogany still has a really bad impact on the environment. Like imagine any forest and, and Think of any forest, even in you know, Canada, and think of a really important tree species and just suddenly snap your fingers and take it out. That's going to have a big impact on the forest, obviously. And it has a big impact in Peru. So although that doesn't look as bad as that, there still is a lot of human impact that doesn't necessarily show up in the same manner. Um, and we've, you know, we've encountered, I mean, this was actually a pretty severe impact. This was not, this was very severe. We, this is a logging camp that we found. It, it's illegal. The landowner had no idea it was there. And we just walked up and, we were like, oh my God, this is supposed to be forest and look what's here. And yeah, I mean, it's pretty devastating. So, you know, even though some of it doesn't get this bad, sometimes it's more hidden. Uh, there are areas that, yeah, look pretty, pretty bad and pretty devastating. And you can imagine that, you know, again, whatever was living in continuous forest is not living there anymore. So, you know, Peru's deforestation is, I'd say, better than Brazil. Um, 
but it is certainly there. And as population grows, if we can't find sustainable methods for these people to live and have forestry and agroforestry alternatives, you know, more of this can occur. Now, when it comes to one of the biggest threats, yeah, gold mining is a big one. So this is a photo I actually took myself from the plains that are coming into land. And you'll see the difference in the river color. And you might think that's natural. To some extent, it can be. But in this case, it's not. One part of that river is coming from an area that's had a lot of mining. And another area is coming from an area that hasn't had as much mining. And that's why the difference in color of the water. Right there, what you see is all of those sort of open areas that are not the river are all from mining. They're all gold mining. Um, I actually got the chance to visit a site, which was an amazing site, but this past year, but we had to um, go through mining, the aftermath of mining to see it. And I mean, this is just unbelievable. I mean, what you see there was dense rainforest until this happened. I mean, it's just like a nuclear bomb went off. I mean, you'll see it here again as well. See how deep that, you see where the land would be and they've dug that deep and it's just gone. Like it was, <laughs> it was it's unbelievable. So the deforestation caused by mining is, is, is just catastrophic. All of here you see, everything that's not river is mining. And the same thing there too. Now this one to me is, you know, one of the, the best or worst examples of it. So the thing about the mining is it's not just that they are, it's bad because of the deforestation, but it's also bad because they actually use mercury in the mining um, and the mercury goes into the water table. And obviously that has a big impact on the environment um, the, you know, all the wildlife, even the people who eat the fish in the rivers. So mining is a massive problem. And, and, you know, obviously it's easy to blame people on the ground. They're often doing it just to survive, but yeah, I think it's, um, I, I, I think it's a bigger problem. It's kind of a societal problem. I don't want to get my high horse, but to be blunt, most people don't need gold and it wouldn't be worth so much if so many people didn't want it. So. You know, you, it's your life. I'm not going to judge, but you know, I don't own own anything gold in it, other than maybe I don't know a piece of equipment where it needs the gold. I don't have any gold jewelry, and um, it's kind of like diamonds. You know, maybe just think about it before you decide to invest in it because you really need it, and think of the impact it has. Um, or you know, think about can you get your gold the gold from a place where it's more sustainably mined, because this type of mining is not sustainable. Uh, and it's really bad for the environment. And Peru has the probably the biggest of all the Latin American countries. Gold mining has proportionally the biggest impact on Peru's environment of any of them. I would say, um, yeah, as another example of it. Now, finally, when it comes to climate change, um, you know, obviously the Arctic gets a lot of attention. You know, Canada, North America. I mean, I can tell you personal stories growing up in Ontario about how much the climate's changed in my lifetime, and probably you guys can see the same thing. But I think sometimes the jungle doesn't get maybe as much a, a sort of attention, so to speak. Um, and it is really vulnerable as well. Arguably, in some way, I'm not going to say more vulnerable, but maybe equally vulnerable in some ways. I want to show you this. Now, this is a really rough graph. I didn't make it. I stole it from Google. I'm not going to lie. Because I didn't really need to be, it didn't have to be Peru. It just had to be the Amazon. So um, Manaus is a very heavily studied region in Brazil. It's a little bit northeast of where we are, but it's still the Amazon. And what I wanted to show you about this really quickly is that you'll see the temperature and rainfall and you'll see how the temperature spikes in like August, September, October, November, and it's actually quite low in January, February. So the funny thing is the hottest time of the year above the clouds is December, January, and February, because that is the middle of the summer. That's like, you know, June, July, August for us, right? In Ontario. The reason the temperature is lower is the cloud cover, is the rain, okay? So the point of this is when you don't get rain, when you don't get cloud cover, the temperature spikes and that causes an incredible amount of drying. And the drying is really fast because at that time of the year, the trees have evolved to expect water. So they're sucking so much moisture in because they're fruiting. And if there's no rain and there's sun, it dries it, but it also gets dry faster because the trees are thirsty. So it's a vicious circle that can cause drying to occur really rapidly. Obviously, this will mean you'll have more forest fires potentially, but it also means species such as, you know, for example, primates that rely on fruit. If, the, if it's too dry, the fruit just won't grow, it'll die. That is their diet. Um, it also means things, for example, like, you know, a frog that relies on a vernal pool for its, for its uh, tadpoles and its eggs, you know, temporary pond. In that time of year, one week of no rain in January, it just dries the ground out so rapidly. I, I couldn't believe it when I first experienced it. Um, and it's devastating. 
Now, you know, I don't know if you guys heard, but right now the region we work in is actually undergoing a massive flooding. So right now, this year, it's been really wet, okay, which is bad for people, but for the environment, it's actually probably good. But generally speaking, things have been getting drier in the Amazon quite significantly. And as any of you know about climate change, you can't look at one year and it doesn't negate all the changes. The general trend in most of the Amazon, and it is regional, but most of the Amazon is for it to be drying. And uh, I don't think I realized how much, how bad drying would be until I'd actually been there because I didn't connect the dots that the hottest time of the year is normally coolest because of rain. And you take the rain out of the equation and it speeds up that drying process much more than you would kind of think. You know, think of Canada, July is not the rainiest time of the year. So when it's hot and dry, okay, it's hot and dry, but we already kind of anticipate it to be kind of hot and dry. It's different in the Amazon when it's the summer, it's super wet and that cools it down. So when you lose that, it actually dries it out faster. So yeah, it, it, it's a problem. So climate change is a big risk as well for our area. It's really hard to even predict how it will, there's been, there was a paper recently that had some predictions about what you know different models of climate could have. And basically the Amazon is, has the most tropical forest of the major tropical regions in the world that could reach a tipping point to no longer be rainforest. I know that's complicated, I hope it made sense. It's a really in-depth paper. But basically, there's a lot of habitat, a lot of habits, a lot of rainforest in the Amazon that is geographically and climatically set that if certain conditions are not met, it can switch and no longer be rainforest. And that's it, it's gone. And it has, the Amazon has the largest percentage of that based on this study of any other tropical regions in the world. Um, now, again, different models change that, it's complicated, but it just shows you how delicate the Amazon is, which even myself have researched it before I went there. I don't think I really appreciated that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I know we're running out of time a bit, so I'll speed through this, but I mean, what I wanted to talk about is sort of, you know, how we help, like, what do we actually do? I told you how we do it, but what does it result in? I mean, basically it results in a lot of cool graphs, which, <laughs> which are useful. Obviously that's data, that's science, right? I mean, this gives you an idea of different um, abun relative abundances of bird populations at different sites that we're working at. Um, you know, this is another example here that this tells you is that species basically in protected forests, there's more birds than secondary. Now you're probably saying to yourself, well, duh, of course, protected forest is better, but you don't know that until you do the science. You can't just say it, you have to prove it. And our research helps to prove that in our area. Um, same with that. So this is really cool. I mean, this is a relatively limited sample size. But it shows you how different sites can be in terms of abundances. You see one site, El Gato, compared to Secret Forest, massive difference in capture rates. It's really, really inc incredible how much it changes. Um, and then but the interesting thing is that, so this is a, a model to predict diversity, is that Secret Forest, even though it has very few individuals, it's projected to potentially have as many or maybe more species than the other sites. So understanding why these things are occurring uh, are, you know, a big part of our research and there's still a lot to be worked on for this and um yeah it's another thing about the bats is really interesting is that you can see 40 percent. this is in two months of intensive sampling we captured over four, nearly 500 bats um 40 percent of those species were only found at one of four sites that we sample so again it's not a you know it's not homogenous it's very heterogeneous the habitat and the species diversity it's amazing that's why we need to protect a lot of the amazon not just one little part or one little part of the park. And then also, you know, learning about the species ecology, you know, this is a, a student that came and did some preliminary research on mixed species bird flocks, and each color represents a different flock of birds and how they interact with each other. And we have a project coming up, hopefully at the end of this year, to look at sort of using radio tracking, if we get the funding, um, to learn more about these flocks and how they interact with each other and how this differs between different types of protection. So yeah, that gives you just a hint of some of the outputs. And then finally, I'll wrap it up and take some questions in a minute, just saying, you know, if any of you, uh, you know, are interested in ever coming, you know, working with us in terms of field course or thesis projects. So field courses are basically for people who don't have extensive experience um, sampling animals in the, in the Amazon or in tropical environments. Um, thesis projects, obviously, if you're doing a school project and you need to do field work and, you know, we love supporting that and working to develop it. You know, skilled research assistant internships are people who have prior experience, you know, you've actually done sampling in the jungle and you want to come work with us. Um, not just like one week, I mean, like, you know, quite a long time. You, you have a lot of skills. 
Um, research camp volunteer is a general open ended volunteering, basically. Um, which you get to help with camp a bit, but also our research and, you know, citizen science volunteers are geared more toward a sort of tourists, people who want to come down for a week or so. And just get a sense of what it's like, you know, they don't need prior experience. We just kind of show them, give them a hint of what our work is like. And yeah, I mean, I've worked with people from literally, um. Yeah, other than Antarctica, I've worked with people from every single continent in the last, you know, two and a half, three years. And, um. Yeah, it's an amazing opportunity to meet people and, and I, you know, I'm friends with every person here. I can name them and I can say I still talk to them pretty regularly, actually. Um, and yeah, same thing. <laughs> so Ellie and Lewis, crazy, amazing, fantastic people. Um, and yeah, I mean, you get people involved being uh, like Ella here was actually, she has a degree in neuroscience, but she really liked herping and she decided to go down for six weeks. And she was amazing. She's like a small woman, but she is a powerhouse, really incredible. Um, and yeah, like Roman, he's actually sells insurance, but he's had a passion for herping his whole life. So he came down for six weeks and he was an amazing part of our team. Super useful. A lot of the photos you've seen today are actually his actually. So, um, yeah, I mean, that kind of gives you an idea of, uh, of what we do and what's going on down there. And, um, yeah, sorry, I went a little over one hour, but that's common for me, <laughs> but uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And yeah, I hope you have some questions. I'm more than happy to answer them. Awesome. Thank you very much. No problem going over. Um, we definitely have some questions here. So cool. I'll start with the text question we got from Talia. She has two. First, she says, have you ever considered leaving this profession? Yeah, good, good question. Um, <laughs> that's a really complicated question. The, the, I mean, my life's been a, a strange road, road to get here. I won't go into it, but it's not the normal route to, to get here. Let me just, just say that. That's very much an understatement. Um, but now that, I, now that I'm in it, do I consider it? You know, I would argue for me, I never considered leaving it now because uh, I went through a really big life change um, uh, with my family and a relationship. It's a long, sad story, but it was really rough. I was in a really, really dark place about five and a half years ago. And um, it's actually really funny. Um, well, it's not funny, but it, I guess that's a good ending. Um, I was really depressed. I'm going to be honest, really depressed. And um, I hadn't gotten out in nature and I just was lost. And uh, someone from the Royal Ontario Museum, actually the head of biodiversity at the time, he sent me a message. He's like, hey, are you going to come in, uh, and help us with the bio blitz um, in, uh, in Toronto? And I was like, God, can I even do it? Like, can I actually mentally, emotionally do it? Um, I went there and I was just surrounded by like 300 people who were like, absolute nature nerds and i say that with love like seriously and it was the first time i felt happy in, in in five months and i realized that moment i was like i need to do this if i don't do it i i won't be able to live I, you know so in terms of whether i've ever considered leaving this profession yeah i don't think i can i don't think i could live um have i ever considered leaving the jungle um yeah sometimes i will be honest because it's amazing but it obviously but it's hard because we don't get paid. I don't really, I mean, I get, I do get paid, but it's like 40 cents an hour. Okay. So, um, I can't really travel easily. Um, I'm traveling here to Europe on money that I had from last time I worked in Canada, not from anything I earned in Peru. And, um, you know, to be blunt, um, you really, it's hard to, I mean, it, <laughs> I'm really selling it. If you're 21 and you come to Peru and you're working with other 21 year olds, there's some potential for relationships. I'll leave it at that. But, you know, as someone who's older, who's maybe thinking, I wouldn't mind having an actual partner for a long period. It's really hard when you're in the jungle. Um, and I know a lot of my friends feel exactly the same way. Um, so those are challenges. So I thought about that and I kind of, in my head, it's like, do I leave a place that's amazing or do I stay, but be poor and lonely? <laughs> it's, yeah, I'm hoping in the future, I'll find a way to do both. That's my goal, but enough about me. But, um, but basically for me, I've just found that working in this field is, is, is what I have to do. And I think most of the people I know who work in ecology, biology, conservation, um, they reach a point in their life in their you know, later 20s, 30s, where they're like, this is what I have to do. And even if I'm not making that much money off of it per se, and you know, I'm not rich, it's just a part of who you are. And for me and most of my friends, that's just how it is. Great answer. So she has a second question, a little <laughs> less, uh career oriented she goes how do you catch a caiman yeah so caimans there's a couple ways you can catch them um so i showed you in the video there basically what you're doing is um the one way the way we do it most of the time is quite literally both hands around the neck it's just grab them around the neck and 
a couple of things that come up. One, that sounds horrible for the animal. Well, I mean, actually, they don't like it. Of course, they don't like it. But caimans are, they are tough. They are like, like, imagine the biggest football player in that neck. You know, it's like, you're not really going to hurt him. You have to really be strong. Like, you just, you can't strangle a caiman. Like, honestly, they're so powerful. Um, and the thing is, once you grab them around the neck, they struggle really powerfully, like really powerfully for about two seconds. And then most of them calm down. They kind of like, oh, well, all right, I give up. <laughs> um, so the hard part is you got to line it up and just go. No hesitation. It's like, boom, you just go for it. And then you hold on. And once that you're done for the ride, then you've got it. Um, that's why if they're really big, you have to jump on them so your body's over them as well. And you can hold them down a bit. The other way you can catch them is using basically like a dog noose. Um, if you think about dog catchers, they have a pole with a noose that you pull. Um, you can do that. Um, and we actually don't have one at the moment because they're quite expensive. But I would like to get one because for caimans that are over two meters, it's really not possible to catch them without uh, a noose. The downside of the noose is if you get the wrong noose, you could hurt them because it's metal, it could cut them. So you have to be careful to get the right noose. <clears throat> the other thing about the noose is that, um, you know, in some instances, it's actually a lot easier to catch them by hand than a noose. It really depends on each caiman encounter is different. It's like a new puzzle. Like it's, it's that's what's so fun about it, right? Um, so I want to get one of those nooses. We're trying to get the money together to get them there. They're not that much money, but we have a small budget, because of, especially because of COVID. Um, so yeah, usually it's by hand is most of them. That's how I usually catch them. And then you can use a noose as well. Cool. Sounds fun. It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Neil has a question. He's going to go on mic and ask you himself. Cool. Hi, Chris. Thanks for uh, coming to talk to us today. Yeah, my, it's, it's my pleasure, man. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I'll launch right into it. We have a diverse uh, fossil rec record that shows us various examples of ecological collapse, both terrestrial and aquatic. Uh, so with that, you know, availability of data in mind, how much of that is applied to modern conservation biology? Like, do we try and draw parallels between these past examples of ecological collapse that we can see, or is it, are they kind of isolated from each other? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's not really my field of expertise sort of drawing that. So I, I don't want to try to comment too much because I don't, I would say it's, yeah, it's not my field of expertise. Um, what I would say is that. I think a lot of fossil records are more useful for determining taxonomy um, as opposed to definitively trying to model what will happen in the future. Um, I think modeling in the future, but having said that, as I'm thinking about it, there are definitely situations where sort of combination of um, uh, core samples and climate, like historical climate records that are you know, often taken from core samples and carbon dating and car carbon sampling um, are tied to extinction events. So I think in a large scale, you can look at fossil records and determine its extinction events and tie that to climactic changes and also to what the habitat would have theoretically been like at that point when the extinction occurred at a large scale. At a species level, I think it's much harder to do. It's really hard to look at a fossil of an animal and say, you know, this is exactly why it went extinct per se, or it sort of was outcompeted by this or something very species level. So I think at a species level, it's very useful in taxonomy and determining um, relations within species and radius and evolution of species, definitely is super valuable in that. Um, from a conservation point of view, I think it's more um, at a larger scale that you would use it to determine extinction events and potential causes behind them. I hope, I hope that answers that. It does, yeah. I, I plan on building a career off of the concept itself, so I'm hoping that uh, that perhaps there is a way to kind of fine tune it to look more at species models as well. Yeah, I mean, have a, a really good record, but I, I won't keep your time with that. That's a huge discussion. Yeah, <laughs> no, what, what I was going to say too is that, um, like I said, for starters, it's not my field of expertise, so there's probably a lot more research than that you could draw on. The other thing I would say about that is that, um, you know. We're in an age now in the last, I guess the last 10 years, but it's just getting better all the time of computer modeling is so powerful. So a lot of things that historically just couldn't really have been done that would have seemed to be un, unachievable are now becoming achievable. So, you know, when I say that it's generally one of the two that we use it for, uh, the, you know, you never know what's gonna happen in the future with computer modeling and an increase in sampling methods and 
you know, the different ways you can date ages of fossils and, you know, core samples and trees and all that. Yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit. So um, absolutely, that type of forward thinking is always welcome in any field of science, especially conservation. That's my hope. Thank you for your insight. Rob, my pleasure. Uh, Adam, do you want to go next or do you want to read out uh, Gibran's question as well? No, I'll, I have a couple questions on my own, then you can read out Gibran's. Um, so, first question, the first two questions are sort of in the same vein. Um, I think you answered the one, but uh, I'll ask it again anyways. What was your aha moment when you were like, this is, you know, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life? I, yeah. I feel like it was that one, but. Yeah, I mean, for me, yeah, I think it was, a, I, I think for me, I was actually, I kind of, I, well, I was born into working with animals. Um, my family actually, um, it's a long story, but basically the short story is that my family sort of founded a, a charity that worked with um, exotic animals. I hate that term, but I don't mean cats and dogs and cows. I mean, birds of prey, bats. Um, I worked with some primates and some uh, reptiles and amphibians growing up as well. So like I was feeding baby owls when I was seven years old. I was handling vampire bats when I was 10, you know, like I, I grew up around it. Um, so I, I, I kind of had no choice sort of, it, but in a good way, I guess. Um, and then that organization, unfortunately, um, kind of ceased to exist because families can suck. I'll leave it at that. You probably understand me by that. And, um, yeah, it just kind of ended overnight. And, uh, that's when you can imagine, you know, I spent my entire life doing that and then it's just gone. Um, it was tough for me and that's where, why I was in a really dark place. And then. That's when, you know, when I went to that event, um, it just reminded me that, you know, that that's what I was missing, you know, and that, that, that I needed to refocus my life from, I had done a lot more, I'd done field work, but I obviously, because I was caring for animals, a lot of it was, um, um, you know, a lot of it was sort of captive work and educational work and breeding programs and, and that sort of angle of sort of the conservation world. Um, and I decided, you know, I just wanted to refocus my life and decide to go into more field work, more of the research side of it. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad I did because it's, uh, it's what keeps me sane. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I definitely connect a lot with that as well as with that. Just, you know, what's missing when you fall, when you lose, uh, what's going on with your life and everything. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, um, well, I'll, I'll just say quickly one thing on that because I, I don't know how many people are listening. I don't know what all of you are going through in your life. So, and I don't need to know. Um, but I do know, I will simply say this, I know a lot of people in the environmental world, um, doesn't matter, biology, ecology, doesn't matter, wherever you call yourself, if you're out there either studying or working in nature, so many people struggle with um, depression and anxiety and imposter syndrome and, and all these different things, and myself included. And I have friends who are geniuses. Like, I mean, I, I'm not dumb. I mean, I know a few things, <laughs> but I know people who are like, amazing like they blow me away and then we talk to like we have a personal conversation with a beer and they're like yeah i really struggle and i'm just like how can you struggle and but i mean what that shows me though is that we all go through it so if there's anybody out there who's like having that feeling you i know i know it's a cliche it's like bell let's talk you know you're not alone but seriously you're you're not alone like honest to god you, you don't don't give up on it just Find a way to get through it, fight through it. And yeah, if you love doing this work, if what keeps you going, then just fight for it. Um, you're going to probably have to sacrifice a little bit to do it. But if, it, if, 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 it, if it's what keeps you alive and sane, don't give up. Keep doing it. There's even if you have to leave Canada or somewhere or do somewhere else, you know, don't give up. If, if, it, if it's what fills your soul, so to speak, or makes you feel alive, then, you know, keep fighting for it. Seriously. Thank you. Um, so second question, sort of along the same vein. Um, you know, equally depressing, I guess. Uh, you you spent a number of years in the Amazon rainforest and everything. Um, yeah. You've been all over and, and experienced a lot of uh, different types of research and everything. What was your uh, oh shit moment for, you know, climate change is real, it's affecting the Amazon. Like, like what did you personally witness see, hap or see happen that was like, this is happening right here, right now? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think for me, when it comes to some uh, climate change, at least specifically, it's, um, you know, it's what I was describing about watching things dry up in, in the Amazon. I couldn't believe how, um, so in rainy season, the thing that most is affected, like the group of animals most impacted um, are really frogs, you know, frogs and toads and neurons. And it's loud and they're everywhere. And they're just like, they're all over the place, right? You, you know what it's like in Ontario in the spring in a pond. 
we'll take that, but make it the whole forest for four, four or five months. And that's the rainy season, right? Um, but this one year it was, uh, would have been the 2018, 2019 rainy season. So yeah, November until like, you know, April, it was quite dry. I mean, okay, it rained, but honestly it was quite dry. And we had one stretch where it was um, five consecutive days with not a single cloud in the sky. And I couldn't believe how quickly things dried up and the frogs just disappeared. Like, you know, five days without rain in Ontario and there would still be ponds. There would still be frogs at night calling in the jungle. Goodbye. It's gone. It just dries up. Um, and that just made me realize that, you know, things down here, as I was explaining, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vicious circle. Everything is so perfectly in sync normally that when things go wrong, they can go really wrong. Now, obviously there's all, like I told you, there's years that are up and down, but if this happens consecutively, and that's why I'm really glad it's raining there right now, it's good for the environment, but if we have this drying occur over consecutive years, there's definitely a tipping point that it can reach. And, you know, I feel like I got a hint of what that could be like firsthand. So for climate change in our region, that, that period, that January actually was um, really startling how little it rained, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, that, that sounds uh, really jarring, especially from uh, the perspective in Ontario where, yeah, as you say, you know, it doesn't rain for even a week or two weeks, three weeks. It's, yeah. you know, there's, while it does start to dry up, you still have those ponds, you still have frog tapping I mean, and stuff. That, that's the thing you, what you really, this is the thing I don't think I'd connected in my head before I went there is that, you know, this picture, you can see all those trees, all that vegetation, you know, 40 meter trees are common, right? And so much vegetation. And we live, uh, we work in what we call a seasonal rainforest, which means there's definitely a dry season and it's normally quite dry, but then the rainy season is really, really rainy. But the trees survive the dry season because they've evolved to survive it. You know, they, they don't consume as much moisture, they don't grow, all the species adapt to it. But because of that, they grow really rapidly. They fruit, everything is depending upon that rain. And yeah, when it's gone, it's just, it's, it's like I said, it's really startling. It just shows you how perfectly adapted the, that environment is in so many ways, but you know, if it changes because of our actions, um, it, it could be bad in the future, no question. Not to get depressing, but yeah, it could be. Um, so final question, uh, we have a number of students here um, that I'm sure are curious, and we're also recording this session and uh, posting it on YouTube later. Uh, you talked about uh, Fauna Forever and different positions and different opportunities to get involved in everything. What does that actually entail? Like how would a student that at our college that, you know, we're all environmentalists here. Yeah. Um, how would a student realistically get involved and how, what, what would that cost? What would that look like? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, basically what I would say is that um, most students, um, you know, yeah, most students are probably going to be fitting into uh, a field course uh, uh, internship um, or potentially a project. Um, you know, I, I'm not completely sure what, you know, funding rules are relating projects, you know, different universities and colleges have different rules, but um, there are many people who come and do their thesis projects with us, for example, but um, a lot of people who are interested in gaining field experience who have limited field experience coming in are going to be working in a, a field course program, um, field course internship. Um, yeah, what that would be is, I mean, our website has the info, but I'm, I'll definitely explain it to you. Um, you come for up to eight weeks. The program can run up to eight weeks. Um, so you have two week segments. Um, and it just basically is meant to, you know, if you pick birds or herps or bats or large mammals, it's meant to all the sampling methods I showed you, you, you do them, we show you, we teach you. So um, you are, you know, helping us gather data, but honestly, we are putting a lot of effort into you as well. Because when you arrive in the Amazon and you haven't done it and you've never been in that area, you can't just step off the boat and suddenly be an expert at all. It's a big learning curve. Um, so we put a huge amount of effort into really teaching you the skills. And, you know, we try to make sure these skills are, are transferable in the future so that, you can maybe your career won't be, you know, ringing, you know, sorry, banding birds in the middle of Peru in the Amazon, but maybe you will do ringing or banding in, you know, somewhere in Canada. Maybe you go to Europe, maybe you go to Australia, I don't know, whatever. Um, so we're teaching you the methodologies that are going to be useful all over the world, really, for wildlife sampling. Um, so that's probably the biggest core, you know, category most people would fit into. Um, now, in terms of cost, yeah, I mean, there definitely is a cost. We have to charge sort of a, a fee for people to come, which personally I hate. I absolutely hate it. Um, it I don't even like talking about it with people because it bothers me. But the reality is we have no option. Um, we are not government funded. 
Um, there is basically no Peruvian government funding for research. Um, let me explain that a bit. There is funding for um, their reserves and natural na national parks, and they have a limited amount of um, sort of rangers that patrol their own park. But the, the data they collect is pretty basic. It's more about big mammals a little bit and protecting the park. It's not learning new things, really. That's no criticism. It's just the reality. Um, and there are a couple of situations where the Peruvian government will partner with other governments in the world to do projects. But honestly, most of the research that goes on um, in most of Latin America is funded either through NGOs such as ours or universities or a partnership between the two. I mean, that's just reality. So um, there needs to be fun. Basically, money has to come to some extent from outside sources outside of the country. Um, to help support what we're doing and you know that's really where the funding goes so um, when people come we would charge a fee that would cover all expenses i mean obviously you have to get your fly there cover that on your own but once you arrive in the city we pick you up we take you to the sites we feed you we give you you know places to sleep all of that is covered it's included in the fee um the fee basically you know i could actually you know i'm not gonna take the time but we could break it down basically the fee is about 80% of your fee is actually covering your costs, 70 to 80%. The remaining 10, 20, 30% above what your cost is, the profit, if you want to use that term, which is really wrong, is reinvested into our research. Uh, so, for example, if we need to new, buy new mist nets, if we need to buy a new motor for the boat, which we did a year ago, actually, it was very expensive. These are things that we, we, we have no money for unless we're able to get some funding basically through people coming. Um, we also take some of that surplus money and reinvest it into um, sponsored positions, which we in a normal year would have for Peruvians because they can't afford to pay, obviously. And occasionally we will also partially or fully sponsor the skilled research interns. And these are people who have extensive experience that are bringing to our camp we're not really teaching them, we're working with them. And we, in that case, for our purposes, it's very useful to ha have them come. So we try to help lessen the financial burden for those people, obviously. Um, the one thing I'll say too, because I know very well how pay to work internships are not popular and I get it. I mean, listen, before I worked in Peru, I spent, um, before I got this job, I spent about a year um, basically painting houses because I couldn't get full-time work in Canada. I had to survive, right? So I know how hard it is to get work in this, this industry, this, this world. I hate that we have to pay people to come down. I don't like it at all, but um, it really is necessary. And a lot of people will say, well, you should just get a grant. Like I've heard that, maybe no one here is thinking that, but trust me, I've heard this so many times. Just go get a grant. Like they're just giving money away. It's not that, it's, not, it's really hard to get grants. It's so hard. One of the challenges we face in our area is that because it's such a big region, believe it or not, we don't have that many species that are listed as endangered, which is good, but bad because you can't get funding as easily unless the species is endangered. Unfortunately, a lot of um, grants and foundations, um, they don't prioritize a region, they prioritize a species, a figurehead species. So it means that the whole Amazon is under pressure, is really endangered in every country it's in, whether it's you know Peru or Bolivia or Brazil or Colombia, Ecuador, or Guyana, Venezuela, it doesn't matter. They all have huge problems. But instead of saying, well, the Amazon in general is, 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 is you know, endangered, so we should fund projects in it. They're like, well, but do you have an endangered species you're studying? No, sorry, you don't qualify. And it just means all these great questions and projects that are really important we can we have a lot of trouble getting funding for. So yeah, unfortunately we do need to charge people and, and that is it. And, and I just like to explain it because I don't like it. I wish people would just come for free because it's something everybody should get to experience. But, but yeah, I mean, what I will say is when people come is we do everything in our power to give them an amazing experience and give them real skills that will be useful. And our field course program um, is something where you can get a certificate at the end of it. Like we give you a certificate of completion so you can actually say, you know, I've done this, I have these skills, these people certified me with these skills. So we've tried to give as much as we can back to people who have come back for sure. So can all that information be found on your website or? Yeah, absolutely. It's all on the website um, and it's just faunaforever.org. And, you know, if anybody's, uh, if anybody's seen this now or if it's recorded, 
I mean, I'm really active on social media on you know, Instagram and Facebook, especially. Um, seriously, got a question? Just, just fire, in, fire me a message on Instagram or Facebook. I'm really happy to chat with people at anything, anytime. And uh, it's my, especially now because I'm not not in the jungle. So feel do, free to just send me a DM if you guys want to chat or know more about it. I'm really happy to talk about it. We do have one more question. Yeah. Gibran has a, actually a very important question. He says, so Chris spoke about the challenges to the Amazonian rainforest. Some of them were related to phenomena such as climate change, but others were based on profit, such as deforestation uh, for cattle and mining. Yeah. Can we create a counterweight in terms of sustainable social business practices that stimulate the local economy, but also help the forest <laughs> restore and regrow? And if so, how? Other That's than ecotourism. Yeah, what, what, did, 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 the, what was the last part? Did, did he say other than ecotourism? Yeah. Yeah, a lot. Okay, so that's a great question. That is, that's the, really, that's the key of long-term sustainability, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, that's why I asked about ecotourism. Ecotourism is, is really important. I mean, I can't undersell that enough. Um, so that's a huge part of it. That is really important. But aside from that, because that, that's, you can't only live off of that, um, yeah, I mean, a big part of it is really um, trying to find sustainable, you know, agriculture ways, ways so that people can. So the thing is, when people view um, mining and logging, uh, which are the two biggest issues, I mean, hunting is an issue, but it's almost a symptom of the others. Right. Um, so really, the big the big issues mostly are, you know, logging and mining, aside from climate change and all that, but logging and mining. Um, People view their forest um, and their gold, which they feel is theirs because it's in their land or their area, as a resource, financial resource. And they, they're just like, listen, I need money. If I cut this tree, if I get this gold, I get money. That's it. Um, they are generally, and I, I don't want to generalize, you know, gringo going down there generalizing, but it is the reality. And Peruvians will tell you this if you speak to them. They don't usually think long term because they haven't really ever had that in their culture in, in the jungle. This long term investment, this, this thinking about how, you know, sort of suffer a little bit now to build something to then be able to make money sustainably in the future. It's not something they've generally thought of. And a lot of them have grown up culturally thinking, you know, the Amazon is amazing. It's lush. It'll never disappear. The animals will never be gone. There's so much of it. And that works 100 years ago. But again, now when you've got new machinery, new technology, you've got foreigners coming in with money to take resources and you've obviously got more people. It's not sustainable anymore. So, aside from ecotourism, which is really important, and multiple studies have shown how important it is, especially when it's done the right way, of course. Um, yeah, agroforestry and sustainable agriculture, you know, is really, really important. So, I guess a couple examples would be uh, probably the best example um, is uh, something like um, uh, Brazil nuts. Okay, I know you're like Brazil nuts, but Brazil nuts are a really good example of it. Um, they grow on a tree, obviously, and the tree is not something you can plant in a big crop. You can't just plant, you know, 500 Brazil nuts and then in, in 10 years they're just producing nuts. It takes years for them to grow and they have to be a, in a continuous rainforest. All right. Um, if, you, if you just cut it all down around them, the tree will not survive. It'll die. It won't produce nuts. It'll be, it'll be gone. You lose that. So um, one of the sites we actually work at, which is called, which is called Boca Paramanu, um, they have a massive amount of Brazil nuts in their forest, uh, Brazil nut trees in their forest. And what they've done is they set it up very sustainably. So they have a network of trails that allows them to access all the trees. They harvest it. They then export those uh, Brazil nuts to all over the world. And it's actually a, a really good thing because it, it sort of forces them to maintain their forest. And they now view the forest as a sustainable moneymaker where it's not a one time cut it down and it's gone. It's actually year after year after year. And you know, projects like that, um, and also, for example, um, agroforestry, where you are basically um, sort of growing native species under a canopy, okay, and also shade grown coffee, uh, that's more in the Andes, but that's a really good example, too. Um, you know, teaching people ways to um, have a certain percentage of intact forest while still being able to get some kind of agriculture to be able to, to sell it and also provide food for local people. Um, and one of the things that, you know, we try to work with is, as I've kind of explained, is assessing the impact of agroforestry and, and just like you know, ecotourism, it sounds great, but until you know it actually works, you can't say it works. So we need to develop these programs, but at the same time, monitor the impact of them. Um, you know, I, I think, again, I, I mentioned shade-grown coffee. That's an amazing example, although we don't have coffee in the lowlands in Peru. 
we do with coffee all throughout the Andes in Peru and obviously in Central America and uh, mountains as well. And, you know, shade grown coffee um, has been shown multiple studies to maintain about 80 to 90 percent of the bird diversity that you would have without the, that shade grown coffee. So you can imagine that if you think of plantation coffee, where it's literally a monocrop, nothing but coffee, um, it's basically what, 5%, 10% of the bird diversity, like almost gone. Meanwhile, shade grown is 80, 90%. So, you know, finding systems and um, finding strategies like that, that people have to live their life, they can make a living, they can eat, obviously, um, but still be able to maintain a significant amount of the biodiversity. That in conjunction with protected areas and corridors where genetic flow can occur, and those few species that can't adapt can exist still, um, that to me is, is is the future. It's just getting there is difficult because of finances, because of politics, because there's a whole bunch of hurdles. And you know, it's a real shame this year of COVID has been such a step back all over the world for conservation initiatives. And Peru is no different. Um, you know, the river that we work on, when I first got there, there was gold mining going on right in the river. Like we'd go down to the port to get you know, food for our camp, but there'd be gold mining across the river, like literally mercury going in the river. Uh, the government stopped that and good for them. They actually came in and said, listen, this is illegal. We're actually finally cracking down on this. You can't do it. But with the pandemic, the government has no resources. Peru has been hammered and people are starving. They have no money. So those that mining has come back again and, you know, logging has picked up. There's been more hunting. So the pandemic's really been really bad for the environment. Um, and uh, it shows you how, how tenuous some of these strategies can be. So there's definitely hope, there's definitely options, there's definitely plans, but um, it, it's, uh, it, it takes a lot of commitment and it takes things to, to, to go well. Uh, we don't need more pandemics, that's for sure. Hmm. We do have, oh, oh Adam, go right ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanna make a comment on that for all the people watching as uh, some of you are first or second year, but uh, you know, it's really interesting because at Fleming we're taught about all the different benefits of, of various things, you know, the socioeconomic benefits and the environmental benefits and all the other stuff. And, you know, you know, in, in other parts of the world, we're seeing uh, benefits where like there's, you know, during the shutdown, um, animals are able to be more free. And, you know, we saw aquatic animals uh, in rivers and, and streams that we didn't previously see them for a long, long time. But then we're looking at uh, down in the rainforest where they, they have lots of animals and lots of other things going on, but, um, they're getting more hit negatively. So it's just, uh, you know, things hit yeah. different areas very, very differently. And so it's just a really interesting. Uh, very true. That. Very true. And I mean, it's the same. I, I, I don't, I, I'm pretty confident in a lot of places in Africa and Asia, it would be the same where the loss of income from ecotourism mostly has meant that, you know, entire conservation strategies built upon ecotourism, which are effective and actually sustainable in a normal world have collapsed. Um, and, you know, it really highlights the whole question about a lot of people are very negative about flying because of carbon, which I understand, but in working where, where I am, I mean, I would say flying to come to Peru for tourism, especially if it's really ethical tourism and there's a purpose behind it. Um, although that's hard, that's a, that's a complicated subject, but yeah, tourism where they're actually trying to engage in the culture or the wildlife um, so, and, and the money's going into local communities more. Um, I think it easily outweighs the, the downside of carbon. Personally, um, I think that if you're flying, you know, back and forth for meetings, like if you're going to fly from Toronto to New York three times a week for a meeting, well, that's a different situation. But um, being able to come down an area like this, and that's not just Peru, in Africa, Asia as well, I think it has a really good impact. But I think it's important if you're going to do ecotourism that you do know where your money's going um, in terms of a, re a, a reliable organization, you know, not just us, but others, but also, um, you know, who owns the organization too, you know, that's important. And what I mean is that. Uh, the river that we work in, mostly the Tambacata River, uh, I think now there is oh, about 76 eco lodges on that river. Like it's crazy, but um, almost every one, I think 72 of them are all owned by Peruvians. And I think four of them have partial ownership of American and British, but like 72 are Peruvian. And that is so good because not only is the money going into Peru, I mean, that's the obvious that, yeah, it's going back into Peru. But what I view, it, what I see in that is I think, okay, and I know one of the families quite well, actually. And like the whole family is making money off of tourism that's sustainable and good for the environment. And think about it. They're, re they're not super rich, but they're not poor. They're relatively well off. And everybody knows them as the people who've gotten money from tourism. And how did they get that money? 
because they protected wildlife so the tourists would come. Think of how the mindset changes when people grow up saying, so I don't have to kill these, you don't have to cut these trees or go mining. I could actually be very successful, travel the world, because that family travels a lot actually, um, see other places, and I could do it by saving the environment and not actually cutting it all down. Like it change, it's a shift in the mindset. If you can show people locally how they can be really successful financially by actually protecting huge swaths of land, like this particular family owns uh, and, and protects a huge amount of land. Not, uh, they have one lodge, but they, they own multiple other parcels of, parcels of land for tourism and expedition, and even just to protect it, because when it's protected, there's more animals, so the tourists like it. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, the loss of this can be really bad. So um, it is really interesting to see how, the, how it changes in different parts of the world. But um, yeah, I think for the most tropical regions, it's, the pandemic's been really negative. So we have one last question. I think it's a good one to end on. He goes, James says, what other organizations slash academic institutions are you partnered with? And have any of your interns or partners ever gained subsidy via their academic institutions? Yeah, good question. So um, we don't, at the moment, we don't have a sort of continuous long-term partnership with other uh, institutions like universities or colleges. Um, we would like to have that. Um, I'd love to have that, but um, it, it's just difficult. Um, a lot of organizations have long-standing that uh, you know collaborations that have been going on for many decades, and a lot of other universities and colleges just don't want them. They have no interest in doing that. They want full independence. They want to be able to pick where they do their work, and that's it. Um, so we're open to it. We'd love to do it. We we, we keep talking to people, but you know it doesn't exist right now. Um, in terms of other NGOs, yeah, we have a we we have a. I would say a really good working relationship with many NGOs in the in the Peruvian region, um, both locally in Madre de Dios and also throughout the whole country. Um, and then we also, you know, have worked with, um, you know, multiple, you know, for example, I guess indirectly, I, I could try to list off names, but um, I may not remember them all right now because it's kind of tired, and you may not even know these organizations. But one, for example, is we have sort of indirectly a partnership with um, with San Diego Zoo, where we're not like a core partner. But we work for another organization that is a partner of them, and some of their funding comes that organization, which we partner on projects with. So, yeah, it's it's complicated. There's a lot of partnerships that go on with um, small scale and large scale NGOs um, throughout throughout the world. Um, but again, how much money and funding comes into to our research it is variable. Sometimes we get some of it, sometimes we don't. Uh, in terms of getting, um, you know, having students getting their projects um, funded, yeah, it it, it is really. That's something we don't really control, right? Um, we definitely have had some some students come by where they've gotten funding through their institution, um, or they've gotten grants as a student. Um, it was definitely as possible. It's quite possible. I would argue that it's actually, generally speaking, easier for students to get funding for projects than us. And you might say, how can that be? It's because there's a lot of organizations, foundations, I should say. That are specifically designed to help fund young biologists, young conservationists. And also, if you think about it, if you are coming to do a project um, or you're just coming to learn and enhance your career, um, you know, two thousand dollars, three thousand dollars is, is a lot of money. That's really good. If you think about an organization like us, and we have staff, and we have all these people coming, we have camps, we have boats. I mean, I would take three thousand dollars, sure, but it's not going to change our entire, you know, our entire organization. It's not going to be changed by that. And um, it's, it's, you know, I would argue, like, for, for smaller scale grants or medium sized grants, it, it's definitely not easy, but it's definitely possible for students to get it. And, you know, we try our best to help facilitate that as well. I mean, I've got, a, I spoke to, just an example, spoke to a student um, from Sweden um, last week, and she wants to come and do bird research with us, and she has a grant application by, that's due by the end of April. So, well, her and me had a three hour conversation about bird projects or a thesis. And she's going to pick one of the projects we talked about, and then she's going to, you know, do a grant. And I, I think she has a very good chance of getting it. Um, and then hopefully she'll be coming down in the fall to for about three months to to do her field work to collect the data for it. And we'll help her the whole. We'll be like a co-advisor when we do these projects. We act as an institutional advisor, sort of, um, and then the school. So it's kind of between school and us. We co-advise the project, um, the project creation and data collection, um, and sort of the um, the, 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 um, the, the, the theory behind the question is, is we, we, we sort of do that with them. And then some of the statistical analysis is often sort of the school does more of that because 
we're in the jungle and we can't sit there and go over every line of code on R with them. But uh, but yeah, we, we partner a lot with these students to help with their projects because we want the data as well. I mean, we want to be involved in these research projects. So, so yeah, I would say for, you know, getting money from institution, it, it just depends on the school. Uh, but grants are out there, although they're hard. They're, they exist, especially for students. Awesome. Well, I know it's getting late for you. It's almost 2 a.m. for you, right? Yeah, um, it's fine. I like no, it. it's been great. I don't feel it's been tired super now, interesting, <laughs> super interesting, super entertaining. Um, I know you mentioned you know Josh Felton. Yeah. He will actually be presenting next Tuesday at, at 7 p.m. If you <laughs> you're welcome to tune in, I can send you the link for that. I mean, I might watch it. Uh, I might watch it if I could get the link for the recording. For the YouTube, yeah, it. for sure. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I don't stay in until two. I might. <laughs> But uh, That's fair. yeah, Josh is uh, Josh is amazing. Actually, he's I've gotten to work in not a lot, but a few times in some surveys in Ontario. And he's a uh, he's a legend. Absolutely, I'm sure all you know that, but he is an absolute legend. I, I yeah, I love the guy. Yeah, he's great. He's great. Well, yeah, I just want to thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think you got a lot of people here realizing that they're in the right field, <laughs> and uh, very excited to move down to the Amazon. <laughs> Um, with that, I say thank you. And I know that Neil, uh, once you're done, is going to give a little speech about the election, but you don't have to stick around for that. Cool. Adam, okay. do you have anything you'd like to say? Nope, that's good. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you so much, Chris, for your uh, time and late hour. Uh, we'll be connecting again soon. Uh, oh, and uh, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll try to set this up again, and we'll even uh, look into potential to try to set up a fundraiser or something, and then see see how the interest is about that. But I'll we'll connect with you about that separately. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, uh, for everybody everybody who watched it, thanks a lot. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. And as I said again, if anybody's got questions, feel free to fire them up to me. I'm always happy to answer it. So thanks a lot, guys. Really have fun. Thank you too. Take care, Chris. Take care. All right, Neil. Do you have any words you'd like to say about the election? Oh man, that was, I, I will say about that. That was an amazing presentation. That it was certainly was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so some of you first semester students, if you're here may have already heard this from me earlier today. Uh, so feel free to, to bail on me or stick around and listen. Uh, right now we have the elections happening. Uh, so we're in a nomination period where students can gather signatures from other students in order to meet uh, the criteria to to campaign for election. So there's different positions with the FSA. There's director of athletics, communications, community outreach, ecological <laughs> sustainability, student life, uh, president, vice president. Uh, we're looking to fill all of those positions and we need enterprising young leaders such as yourselves to kind of uh, step up to the plate and, and take those leadership positions for next year. Uh, it's super fun to work with the FSA.